so that it can be a podcast. Hello, Grandma Mary Margaret Pruitt. Hello, Granddaughter Kaylee. <laughs> I'm Kaylee Margaret Pruitt. Hey, I'm <laughs> Yes, you know, it's so odd. Just all of a sudden in the last 24 hours, I have come across people named Mary Margaret um, really? many times in the last 24 hours. Uh, the first was my friend sent me a quote from Glennon Doyle's book. Have you heard of her book, Untamed? Um, not a lot, if I ever. She was an evangelical Christian writer, and she wrote a book about how she saved her marriage with her husband who had had affairs. And then she fell in love with a woman, and she married a woman, and she writes a book about, she, in the excerpt that my friend sent me was actually, she was in a psychiatric ward treating for bulimia, and she was talking to her roommate in the psych ward who was named Mary Margaret about her great grandfather who was a coal miner in Pennsylvania. And oh, she was talking about how he told her story or she used to hear stories of how he would, they would bring canaries into the mine. And when the canaries stopped singing, that was a sign that they needed to get out of the mine because it was toxic. Um, that was very interesting. So speaking of, this is um, the Canary Collective podcast because I wanted to have a podcast kind of radio show talking about issues that I wrote songs about, like our healthcare system and how we can improve and how we can have uh, restored ecosystems. And I am talking to the people who inspired me to write the songs, people who are my heroes and heroines, and you're one of them, Grandma. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. You're one of my heroines too, darling. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind. You have so much courage being down in that coal mine <laughs> and being the canary. Well, we are, I guess we're all in a coal mine, maybe, figuratively, but I am definitely feeling it. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you for saying that. Um, how, just first of all, I wanted to just give a preface of what we want to talk about today for this specific episode. We have had an episode about my song, Been to the Future, which was inspired by a water rights activist who wore a t-shirt that said, I've been to the future and we won. And I got to chat with her son and, and her, Nikki Sakura. And then I talked with, um, my friend Chiara D'Angelo about my being inspired by her work to remove dams in Washington state for the song Dam Dam <laughs> and talked with a woman named Lisa in Germany. So cool that we can do that um, about the believe her and sexism in healthcare. And uh, I want to talk with you about one-sided glass which is one of the songs on the album that I wrote partially inspired by you. It's a very personal story. It takes a lot to tell it. I've been really afraid to talk about it because there's so many things that people could hear and be like, wow, that is way too weird for me. <laughs> so I feel very safe talking to my grandma about it. But, oh, are you getting the lyric booklet out? <laughs> oh, I'm glad that you have that. Yeah. Yes. So in the lyric booklet, there's a picture of your mother, Mildred Ride. That, that's correct. <laughs> that is very true. I, I recognize that picture. It's on my bureau, so I see it every day. <laughs> yeah, I stole that picture when I was in your bedroom, and I took a picture of the picture. <laughs> Oh. You are a very amazing videographer. <laughs> well, these phones, they do a lot. And it's amazing to have this technology. I'm so sad that I can't be with you in person right now, but I'm so glad we can connect. I'm in California in Joshua Tree, and you are in Seattle. And um, you are 94 years old. And a half. 
and a half already. Time has flown since your birthday in January. <laughs> in June. I'm pushing it. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, how are you feeling during the pandemic, first of all, and how has that affected your day-to-day -day life? It's affected my day-to-day -day life, but um, otherwise I am in a protected, happy, resourceful, <laughs> comfortable, friendly place. Good. I, I hope you are, all of the above. I'm feeling pretty safe and comfortable now. It was, it was a wild ride for a while. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Well, it's, it, uh, the p pandemic is very serious. Your great, great grandfather, Dunlap, died of the flu epidemic that was in 1918. I don't know if you ever knew that. I didn't know that. It's just that, yeah, flu is, is very significant. And we, we do well to be cautious about it. My friend who's dealt with polio uh, for many, many years was reminding me that it took something like eight years to develop the immunizations to prevent polio. Eight years, and we're hoping to have a flu virus <laughs> preventive back in the medication by December. It's just not, not maybe realistic, so we do need to be prepared for a long siege. Yeah, well, it's very interesting to talk to people who have lived through um, multiple decades of ups and downs that the globe has gone through world wars and droughts and depressions and positive things too. Um, and I'm wondering if this reminds you of any kind of time when you felt like, wow, this is big. I can't believe this is happening. You hear about it in history books, but now it's happening. Yeah. Oh, of course. I, having lived this long, Kaylee, I have had many experiences like that. Um, uh, perhaps the first one that I remember was standing in our living room in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and hearing President Franklin Delano Roosevelt say on December 7th that because of the violence that had happened in Hawaii, we were declaring war. That had a very big impact on me personally. I remember the joyous day when I was in Penn State in 1945 when we got the word, the war is over, and we all clustered down in the streets of State College and were thrilled. And I remember um, the day that um, uh, Kennedy, a president who I greatly admired, was assassinated, and your Aunt Cynthia came out of the bedroom where she was home from school and sick and said, the radio said the president has been shot. Mm -hmm. And I remember the 9-11, well, you remember that, Katie. You were a little girl about 12. Yeah. So I have had a number of these these memorable days when I said this is, this is historical. Yeah, but something that really impacts everyone's day-to-day -day life is pretty um, different than even a distant world war. Um, and I'm wondering, like, how does your daily routine change? Because you have an amazing routine. I just want all of the listeners and viewers of this podcast, all 12 of you, to know that my grandmother is an amazingly active activist. Uh, you were a nurse trained at Yale and Penn State, and you operated as a school nurse. And you and my grandfather, Paul Pruitt, have been for decades and decades working to encourage our healthcare system to be accessible and affordable to all through your activism in that arena, supporting immigrants, um, all kinds of uh, jubilee efforts to relieve debt around the world, and 
you're very involved with your church, although ever this is this episode is not um, an episode to try to convert someone to be in a Christian faith, just getting that straight. But we will talk about faith and religion in, in this episode, because uh, the song is kind of about that. But um, now you're going to Zoom church? <laughs> Yes, Katie, your memory is phenomenal. I don't even see you looking at notes. My <laughs> grandmothers are allowed to say things like that, I hope, on <laughs> educational plots. Um, okay, my daily routine, which seems sort of boring to me, but just, you know, to say it. Um, first thing I do when I get up is take my temperature because I do want to be safe. And it consistently runs in the 97th somewhere, 2468. And then, um, I eat two prunes <laughs> and, and uh, probably eight to ten ounces of water, and then I uh, get dressed before eight o'clock because at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, one of the exercise uh, employees here at this retirement community where I live uh, has recorded 30 minutes um, strengthening and stretching, and sometimes jazz exercise Ooh. of routine. So every day at 8 o'clock, I do half an hour of exercises. I don't have weights, so I use two cans of either canned tomatoes or they weigh about a pound of beef. And I do have a stretch band, uh, band that they provided, and that's very helpful. Then I uh, take care of breakfast and emails and correspondence and bills and usually sometime during the day. Oh, the next part of my uh, present daily routine is to call my very good friend and say, I'm up and had breakfast and are you ready? And she says yes. And then I read to her for about 30 minutes because she has multiple sclerosis, and um, um, eye complications, which make her legally blind. Uh. And she and her husband had a birth white daughter and adopted a multiracial African-American Caucasian son. And she was given a fascinating book by a man named Doug Bates about an Oregon family that also uh, had a multiracial family, had birthed their own Caucasian children and then adopted two. So I'm reading this book to her a chapter at a time. And after that, I called another friend who also was legally blind and uh, was trained in seminary. And I read uh, the uh, United Church of Christ uh, email devotion. Uh, to her every day, and by that time, with a few phone calls and correspondence, it's lunchtime, after which I take a nap. During <laughs> lunch, I enjoy reading, and the book I am currently reading is about um, a young couple whose three-year-old daughter was uh, killed in a tragic accident, and since I have been bereaved, as you Though recently myself, uh, it's very meaningful to me to be reading this book at lunchtime as I listen to uh, classic King music on my book box. Um, to read about their expression and experience of grief, and it helps me to to understand the grief and emotions that I have. And after my brief nap, then I love going for a walk through Freeway Park, which is on the border of the property of the retirement community where I live. It's a beautiful park and unique, according to um, your Aunt Cynthia, who is an urban planner, because one of the reasons it was formed was to mask the noise of the interstate freeway from the rest of the community. So it's a lovely park with beautiful and many homeless people these days. But astonishingly, in spite of the fact the weather is better, there are fewer homeless people now than, than there were. And maybe that has something to do with COVID-19, I'm not sure. 
then come uh, dinner with the evening PDF news. And after that, there's usually one or more Zoom meetings. Um, I have tomorrow, I have a Zoom uh, afternoon meeting for the Healthcare for All Washington, which is the advocacy group that Grandpa and I have worked with for many years. We're hoping that maybe Washington State will be the first of the 50 states to get universal uh, health care with single-payer um, funding. And I'm the secretary for that group, so the end of that. The health, I listened to David Donkey, who was at the University of Washington, um, professor in communications, recently retired. I listened to a, a uh, uh, immigration, migration uh, committee meeting from our church. So sometimes there's usually one or more of you two meetings, and that's my day. Wow, and you forgot to mention, what are you eating for lunch? Because I just love your simple, healthy diet. It's so inspiring. Like You don't have to go all out. You can make something really nourishing, easy. Well, today's interesting menu was uh, triple, triple beans. Have you ever seen any of those in the store? I yeah. They have pinto and kidney and garbanzo with a generous lathering of ketchup mm. and a toss salad with lettuce and cucumber and tomato. I can't remember if I had cabbage in it today too or not. And some uh, blue cheese dressing with a little sweet pickle juice to kind of sharpen it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I had a piece of uh, candied ginger and uh, a handful of mixed nuts and eight ounces of milk, skim milk. Oh, yum. Does that make you hungry? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just talked with Aunt Kathy and Uncle Mark um, while I was having lunch, so I kind of had a lunch with them. But um, thank you for sharing your routine, because it's. I just love hearing about what people fill their days with, because <laughs> you never know. But I, you know, on this episode, this conversation, um, I. I'm glad you brought up that you're dealing with grief and you're inspired by the book you're reading about grief because I kind of want to talk about grief and death on this podcast and life after death potentially and that's kind of what the song One Sided Glass is about. So um, just to give people a background of what the song is, um, <clears throat> the song One Sided Glass uh, I wrote um, the main message that I wanted to send is to other canaries who are going through illness, um, often that leaves people bedridden for long periods of time, feeling like we're all kind of boxed into our bedrooms, especially now during the pandemic, we are boxed into our little separate boxes. But before the pandemic and self-isolation and quarantining, I was, as you know, um, mostly in my bedroom for uh, or the, my parents couch for uh, you know months at a time um, unable to really be around very many people um, whether it was because I didn't have the energy or I couldn't sit upright in a chair or talk to people very easily or because my immune system couldn't be exposed to people or I was reacting to people's perfumes so strongly um, so I was feeling lonely and it was reassuring to me to start to connect virtually online several years ago and in person through support groups online, realizing that there are so many people like me with my same diagnoses that were getting really confusing information from doctors that were saying, well, we don't know why autoimmune disease happens and we don't really know what to do with you and you'll probably be bedridden for the next 20 years. That's usually how these things go. And just having people, uh, you know, doctors were telling me, your condition is really rare. It's really rare to have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, heart and blood pressure 
disease that I was diagnosed with. Um, but it, I was finding it's actually not as rare as they were telling me. And I, I, I have a feeling that there are a lot more people who are dealing with autoimmune diagnoses type illnesses that haven't gotten a diagnosis yet, um, but they're dealing with weird digestion issues or joint pain, and, you know, body pain, immune system issues, thyroid issues, um, and can't afford to get a diagnosis or treatment, um, who are kind of stuck not wanting to talk about it, especially mental health issues, stuck with depression, not wanting to talk publicly about it. So you kind of isolate yourself. And the main message of the song is that I don't think that we are alone as much as we think we are. And I don't think that there's no hope as much as some of the doctors were telling me. <laughs> and so that's what the chorus is. I don't think that there's no hope. <laughs> and this, the deeper meaning though, with the song stems from a very uh, interesting story that I want I want your help telling. So um, <laughs> I'll just begin by saying that the story of this song starts in the year 2016 or 15, when I had just been bedridden and I was staying in my parents' house and uh, my, my parents, my mom's cousin, our relative, Tim, kept on knocking on the door. He was their neighbor and he said, I'm so concerned about Kaylee. Can you please, please uh, see if she wants to talk with my psychic? I have this woman who says she's a psychic and she might be able to help because she has a really similar illness. And my parents kept on offering that option to me, but I really didn't, I wasn't quite sure what I believed. You know, if I believed that psychics were real, I was trying to just stick with science, you know, and stick with what the doctors were telling me. So I think we wrote him off for like a year or so. But finally, one day he knocked on the door again and we said, okay, we'll try it. <laughs> so we called her and she said, you know what? I am getting a message. I am a medium and I can talk with people who passed on. Um, to the other side and I'm getting a message from your great grandmother that you know she's really proud and glad that you are going through this type of illness in a time when it's there are more opportunities for women to get better health care and you're at the forefront of that being accessible more to more people and on the cutting edge of that and um and I had a really similar health issue picture. And she called it like she would have hot, where she, her gut was hot or something, or something about hot, a hot neck, or I don't know. But she was said, okay, wait, one more thing before you go. Um, write this down, get out a pen of paper. And I was like, okay. And I was rolling my eyes because I really, I thought she probably tells this to everyone. You know? <laughs> and she said, okay you need to hear this and remember this. Your grace is my sufficiency. And I wrote it down and I put the piece of paper away. And then nine months later, you and I were talking on the phone and I had forgotten about that, but you started telling me a story about your mother. So would you share um, what happened with Mildred Ride when she had her surgery and kind of uh we lost her for a couple of seconds well i was born in january 1926 and i believe it was april of that year there was a flu epidemic i don't believe it was a famous flu epidemic my mother was young I believe she was 35, and she had an adorable seven-year-old son, and she and my father really, really wanted more children. And so finally, I was conceived and had been born four months earlier, and she caught this viral infection. And not only did it go to her nose and her lungs, but it went to her ears, both ears. As you 
you know that you station to are often infected when we have upper respiratory infections. Now remember, this was 1926. No uh, antibiotics whatsoever. Um, very little knowledge about how to deal with a big blood leak. Uh, I think there were no uh, intravenous blood uh, available. Uh, I don't believe that the, that knowledge was yet in common use uh, for people getting to get blood transfusions. So the doctor, the surgeon who treated her, ended up having to make incisions in the jugular vein on both sides of her neck, and she lost a great deal of blood. After the surgery, he talked to my father and very honestly said, she has a 50-50 chance of living. She's just lost so much blood. She is so sick. And my father felt, he told me at that point, as though he was losing everything that he most loved because he knew if his beloved wife died, he would not be able to care for his son and would have to have arranged because his job involved a lot of traveling mm -hmm. and it was a terrible family crisis. I was handed off to an aunt and grandparents for three months as my mother hovered between life and death. She had a day nurse and a night nurse, day and night. And during this time, she remembers feeling so exhausted that even lifting a finger would just seem formidably impossible. She was so, so, so tired. And during one of her hovering between life and death times, she saw a vision and she was not, she never saw another vision in her whole life as far as I know. And it was like a picture, a framed picture. And on the framed picture, she saw a verse. And the verse was in the book of Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And she said she thought at the time, oh dear God, I, I've got the weakness. Uh, and after she gradually climbed up from nearly dying to living, one day she told her surgeon about this and she was aware that her surgeon was uh, not uh, much interested in theology, and she said, maybe you'll laugh at this. And he said, no, Mrs. Dunlap, I will not laugh. And she went home. And just in the future, in the ensuing four years, she was told by more than one doctor that there was really nothing the matter with her. She had recovered. And uh, maybe she should think about getting some mental health counseling because she had this feeling that she was so weak that went on and on and no sign. It wasn't until she moved to a larger community, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that she saw an intern and she said, Mrs. Dunlap, you are severely anemic. And he treated the anemia, and from that on, she was a ball of fire until she was 92. Wow. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the story. When I heard you tell me this, Kaylee, I gasped. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> because that verse has been so important to me all my life because it was so important to my mother. And, and as you know, your grandfather had just recently died before
when you told me this story, and all of a sudden it said to me, the message of one-sided glass, we don't know. We just don't know. We don't know, but it's fun to speculate and have people's lives live on in, in stories and messages and lessons that they've learned in the past. And the, it was kind of funny because actually I, I did, we had this conversation and you told me that story um, several years before grandpa passed, but I was, I think I was too shy to share with you that the psychic had said that because I, I wasn't sure how you would feel. I wasn't sure how I felt about it, but when we were talking on the phone, I think it was 2017, and you said, um, you know, I had just gotten a speed bump in my IV treatment for Lyme and co-infections, and it was really a hard time for me and my health, and I was feeling kind of hopeless, and you said, I wish that there's something I could do, but I just want to let you know that your great-grandmother of you know, a, a phrase that really helped her when she was going through similar health issues is um, your grace is sufficient. My grace, my grace is, is sufficient for me, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for thee. Um, and as soon as you said that, it just rang a bell. And I said, wait, say that again? What, Grandma? <laughs> and I like went over to my desk and I looked for that yellow piece of paper that I had written scribbled that on that the psychic told me to write down because I, I did not resonate. And I didn't really know what that meant when the psychic told me to write that down. And I was just like, okay, I almost didn't write it down. I like sloppily did it. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm writing it down. <laughs> but um, it was really cool to think that maybe uh, it's just a fun thought. We don't know this for sure. And certainly maybe we'll never know until maybe we cross over, but um, it's a fun thought to imagine that people, um, it's like we're in earth school. We're in like a focus group. You know how focus groups, there's like double-sided glass and on one side of the glass, it looks like a mirror. And on the other, they can see it's like a window into the room. And if, Earth is like a focus group and we're here to learn lessons and try things out and bring our own perspectives and opinions. Um, and when you leave to the other side, maybe you go through the door and then you realize, oh, that wasn't a mirror that that was this whole time. People who had passed on could see us and they're rooting for us and they're pounding on the glass and they're like, go, you, you're almost there. You can do it. You can heal. <laughs> um, but we can't quite hear them. But maybe sometimes, Maybe there are mediums who can hear the faint pounding and we can get little clues and hints. It's just a fun thought, not saying that that's for sure. <laughs> I'm with you, Kaylee. I, when I heard that <laughs> you were being encouraged, I don't know. Anyway, I, I'm with you. I, I, would, I don't know that I would spend money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and then yeah. then once grandpa did pass, um, and I we did share this story more, um, grandpa passed away in 2018, is that correct? It, time is correct. just flying, um, so yeah. July, and the memorial at Fauntleroy, where he was a reverend, um, the pastor, she gave an amazing a sermon at his memorial. And one of the lines she said was, um, death is kind of like a horizon. Just because you can't see past the horizon doesn't mean that there isn't something beyond the horizon. And, and so Paul Pruitt may live on beyond the horizon. And just because we can't see them in the flesh and their faces and their, their body right now doesn't mean that he's not still alive in some way and so that then I wrote the song one-sided glass and one of the last verses is um I look for faces but maybe I should look for lines yeah <laughs> beyond horizons one-sided glasses other side we are not alone yeah because 
um, and, and now that our family is going through yet another loss of um, our dear, my dear cousin, Jay Collins, um, it is really uh, interesting to hope for and think that um, at least in our memories, they can live on. And especially during this time of a pandemic, it's, it's nice to, when we are losing a lot of lives, I think even if it's false, a false belief, it's, it's reassuring and helps me with my grief. So is there anything else that um, has been helping you with your grief as you are reading that book, Lessons? Well, ironically, this young couple who have lost the three-year-old uh, attend a seminar where there is uh, a person, I don't know if she's calling herself a medium or not, uh, but she leads some of the participants in, uh, in, in an experience, something like the one that you have described having. The young couple is disappointed because they don't get any message from their three-year-old. And, and the advice that is given them is, well, three-year-olds are, of course, um, more limited in their communication than, than mature adults or even your cousin, my beloved grandson. Um, but I think... Uh, bottom line of the advice was be mindful and be open to what what you are experiencing and to your memories and um, just be mindful because we don't know it all we have five senses we know about those <laughs> but we also talk about that sixth <laughs> and being mindful as we walk and see the flower and the cranny wall and the, the burning bush we meet. I love that poem. Every common bush is aflame with the glory of God, but only those who see take off their shoes. The rest stand around and pick blackberries. I think this is the way with a lot of life daily in my experience, we can be experiencing wonder and who knows, maybe messages if we are opening our eyes to perceptive and ears. Yeah, I know that a lot of people um, listening when they hear people quote the Bible, sometimes that's a mixed um, feeling for them because sometimes religion has been not a safe place for everybody um, in the LGBTQ community or of different religions. <laughs> um, so I, I've always really respected your approach to faith and religion uh, and really being open and loving of people of all beliefs and just, you know, working with the United Church of Christ and Quakers and, you know, different um, denominations that are outwardly, proactively being sure to welcome people who are questioning whatever path they are on um, and people who are of all different cultures and religions and faiths being um, equal and wonderful. And so I just wanted to appreciate you for uh, modeling how you can be, you know, studying the lessons of the Bible and of, of Jesus's life, but also honoring many other forms of wisdom. So thank you for modeling that. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you could try and say some, some of the lessons that you feel overall you've learned in in life that you you would want to pass if if you think that you could imagine you went to the other side and you were frustrated pounding on the glass trying to tell me a message uh what what do you think you might say <laughs> um love love
Judeo-Christian ethic or the Muslim. As you say, you find them in so many, so many of the faiths. But I do believe that uh, they are key words. Hate, revenge, uh, just away. There's another one of your songs. <laughs> Those are positive words, with love being the, the, the most important. I think that... I'd be pounding on your window. I think I'll probably be able to hear that, because they're, they're monosyllabic, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Grandma. Well, okay, you've, you've already learned them, and they are in your, in your songs, and I, I love hearing them in new ways. Oh, I am not done learning them. I have to relearn them. I think that's probably what life's about is to continually yeah. forget and then remember and then forget yeah. and then remember a new side or a new aspect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trying to remember how to um, balance forgiveness with setting boundaries you know a lot of people define forgiveness as saying oh well your behavior's okay but no it's not about saying behavior's okay it's just saying you as a person i still love but your behavior's not yes. okay oh, oh absolutely there there is a there's a lot to learn because um forgive and forget doesn't necessarily go along we need to remember the harshness of life and we need to face injustice and categorically say it is not all right but we kill ourselves if we center on the hatred and do not forget there's no no health in harboring hate yeah but i never i never see that in you kaylee i I'm very grateful that you have been able, all of the doctors who gave you wrong diagnoses, <laughs> I don't see you wasting time uh, in despising them. But it's wrong for you, I think, not to document. You know, they told me at this hospital, but you're, you're fine, you need to concentrate. <laughs> I mean, we could list them. You, don't, you have a better mind than I. But, as I say, I am so thankful that you don't waste your time and energy on that, but you, you reach out to the doctors who have been insightful and knowledgeable and, and uh, helpful. Oh, thank you for saying that, Grandma, because I, I really do. As you know, you're a part of the healthcare field. You know that most doctors have the best of intentions and have worked tirelessly and been put through so much to get to where they are because they want to serve. So I, I believe that intentions of all the doctors I've seen are really pure and good, but just it's the system that is broken. You know, it, people are just operating according to what insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies, which are run by people also with good intentions, but just without the regulations that say, you can't make a billion dollars in this way. <laughs> They're going to make a billion dollars if they can. So yeah. yeah, I think we, we don't, we do waste time when we, when yeah. we blame the, like individuals and say you're evil or you should change. Um, it's more, you know, time efficient really for everyone involved to, to yeah. look at how we can make systemic change so that it's easy to do yeah. the, the right thing is, is an easy choice for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <sighs> but um, I'm wondering, I have another hard question for you. Um, if you could, so at the end of each podcast, I pretend with people that we are in the year 2040 and we have achieved universal health care for all. And all of your efforts and your grandpa's efforts and all of your friends' efforts are uh, being celebrated and people are writing articles about and documentaries about your <laughs> journey. And maybe you will be um, 115. I, I, I would believe it. 
um, regardless of if you're alive on this earth or if we have to talk through the one set of glass, um, do you want to pretend for a minute that we're talking in the present tense and we're, ha we're talking about how glad we are that we kept going in our activism? Uh, and what would I be saying? So I, we just, we just pretend like actors and um, that we are in the year 2040. So grandma, it's so nice to talk with you. Thank you so much. It's the year 2040 and we have universal health care. Aren't, aren't you so glad that it's so easy for people to access health care now? Oh, I can't, I can't tell you what a relief it is. I remember all those school children when I was a school nurse. I remember this little boy who couldn't even see the big E, you know, I remember the eye chart. And he couldn't even see the big E. But his parents were, were telling me angrily, we can't take him to the doctor. We don't have any money. We don't have any money to buy glasses. Even if he does need them. Oh, and I remember the little girl crying in my office with a toothache and crying and crying. And I called her mother and said, you need to take her to the dentist. And the mother said, I can't find any dentist who will take Medicaid. And I said, oh, I'm just thrilled that they, this isn't happening anymore. Oh, I'm so glad, Kaylee. It's just wonderful, but now we still got to fix things because they haven't gotten it yet in all of the countries that are not developed. So we have to keep working. Yes. Will you keep working daily? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm so glad that we are continuing, you know, generation after generation to do things in the honor of what's the best for the greatest good of people and for all the world, not all. just the United States. Absolutely. And sometimes yeah. the United States has really changed in the last 20 years. Since 2020, I, I think it was really a wake up call for a lot of United States citizens to realize that, you know, our country is not doing things in a very efficient way that other countries are doing well. And some are, are really struggling because of United States foreign policy that is pressing down on other countries. So I'm so glad we raised awareness about that and that um, U.S. foreign policy has really changed. Uh, what a relief. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, may it be so. I hope that, I hope that we can uh, make that a reality. And sometimes it's fun to fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to visualize it, to dream it, is yeah. the first step. Yeah. And I have had to do that with my own healing, trying to visualize health before before it happens. And uh, even if it's a placebo effect, it's it's great if it does help. <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah. Remember, whistle a little tune whenever I am afraid. <laughs> oh yeah. Will you whistle that again? Do you have a certain whistle that you like to whistle when you are afraid? Well, I was just remembering that song in Anna and the King of Siam, the musical, where they're, she and her little boy are going to Thailand. They called it Siam in the movie. And, and they're both scared because they don't know what to expect. And she tells him, whenever I feel afraid, I whistle a happy tune. I fool the other people and sometimes I fool myself as well. Remember that? Oh, I haven't seen that since I was like nine. Okay. Oh. Well, anyway, it's, uh, the idea is right, you know. It, you feel afraid, but you say, well, I'm going to act so I don't feel afraid. And then you, you persuade yourself to act bravely. <laughs> yes, that is, that's a lesson that you taught my mom, who taught me as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you sing a little bit of I See the Moon? To close. I see the moon, the moon sees me, the moon sees the one that I long to see. Is that enough? God, God bless me. the moon and God bless me, and God bless the one that I long to see. I, I remember.
remember seeing you back to your mother as your grandfather would be going off uh, in the Philippines to some remote little village to conduct in-service classes. Oh, and you would miss him, and he would be the one you long to see. <laughs> oh, well, you have lived an extraordinary life so far, and you are one that I long to see, but I'm so glad we could make it work to see each other on Zoom and have this conversation. It was a great privilege. Thank you, Grandma. I love you. Thank you, Kaylee. I love you, Kaylee. <laughs> I'm going to end the recording. All right.